Welcome. It's good to have so many of you in the library today. Uh, my name is Tish Hayes. I'm one of the librarians here. Um, and I'll be your moderator for today's panel. Um, quick announcement before we get started. You may have heard, um, but there are sign-in sheets over on the table. So make sure that you sign in now or before you leave today. Um, and if you have classmates who come in late, please remind them too. So today's panel, Alone in the Crowd, um, is an event that's part of our One Book, One College programming. And as in years past, our selection gives us the opportunity to talk to experts about um, on campus about themes in the work. So this year, we've been thinking about loneliness using Kristen Radke's graphic nonfiction work, CQ, A Journey Through American Loneliness. It's right up there. Um, and it illustrates many ways in which we've become estranged from each other's, from each other, ourselves, and um, how we long for connection and how that longing might bring us back to each other. So I'm thrilled to be joined by three of Marine Valley's finest psychology professors um, to discuss what loneliness is, how we became so lonely, <laughs> and how we might find our way to more community and connection. So I'll let each of them introduce themselves and then we'll jump into the conversation. Um, my name is Mitch Baker. I teach psychology here. Uh, thanks, Tish, for moderating and uh, inviting me to be on this panel. I gotta say, it's, it's amazing to be back in person. It's been a few years to do this, so, uh, you know, so it's exciting to kind of relearn this process and see people and uh, and do this so and I recommend uh, checking out this book because I gotta say graphic novels weren't necessarily my thing but I think it was written exceptionally well and well presented so thank you Again, I share the same sentiment with my colleague Mitch uh, my name is Nick Jesus and I teach psychology here as well and I'm again honored and, and I'm thankful to be asked to be part of this uh, I guess it breaks some of the sense of loneliness in our offices, you know, sitting there grading papers and whatnot. It's nice to be part of a larger community. So uh, again, Tish, thanks for uh, thinking about having us present today. Thank you. My name is Laura Lawson Collins, and I also teach psychology, go figure. Um, and thank you for, again, you know, putting the panel together. Um, I think it's a, a really important topic right now. Um, it was important before the pandemic. The pandemic made it worse. Um, and here we are kind of, you know, I still have my mask on, <laughs> uh, still kind of coming out of it. So um, I, it's a very time appropriate book and topic. So thank you. Absolutely. And thinking about loneliness, it might be something that we all have experienced at one point in our life. Um, so we all probably have an idea about what it is, but I really wanted these experts to, to help us define loneliness and maybe also talk about the scope. So what is it? What is it not? And I'll just turn that over as kind of our starting point. I might start off with a clinical definition that I, that I was working on for, for a while. Uh, loneliness for most people is from stuff that I've, from material that I've read, from research that I've read, and from the firsthand accounts of the, of the, of the clients that I see, um, they will tell you that loneliness is a state of isolation, painful isolation, like being cut off from other people, uh, not having any meaning or purpose with other people, or feeling like people don't care about you, or that you don't have anyone to turn to, or you don't have anybody to help you, you don't have anybody to understand you. Um, and uh, this comes, this topic comes up a lot in our sessions. You know, we talk about how you know, loneliness can be a result of a, mitch, a mismatch of interests that people have, like the people around you don't have the same interests that you do, and you don't feel close to them, you don't feel connected, you feel detached, alienated, marginalized. Um, like when, you're, when your need for social contact, for rewarding social contact with others is not there, right? And that's what I think it is. Um, and perhaps my colleagues can maybe speak to what it's not, but that's, I, I think that's a clinical definition that comes from a book, that comes from sources, and if you sit with my clients, that's exactly what they'll tell you. That's how it feels for them. Okay, thanks. Um, you know, I think loneliness may feel like a, a lot of things, but it's truly the sense of being alone or feeling alone, regardless of the amount of social contact that actually one has, right? So being alone does not necessarily mean that one is lonely, though. Like you could be alone watching TV, you can be alone on vacation, shopping, exercising, and you're not feeling lonely, right? So 
Social isolation is by definition not having connections to other people which you desire. Now, so if you have contact with other people on a regular basis, by definition, you're not isolated, but you can still feel alone. Now, these could typically be moments. Um, the duration is, is, is different for each person. You might have chronic ongoing loneliness, or you might have bouts of loneliness where you are with a group and you feel disconnected and you feel even though you're amongst others, you feel alone, right? Isolation is the actual physical act of being alone. So there is a distinction between the two. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, solitude, right? Which could be what you're talking about, right? Solitude could be healthy. Yeah, it, it desired, people, right? desired solitude. Desired right? solitude. Like some people want to be alone. Like many of you probably study better by yourselves, right? And where you could be with your thoughts. Like when you think about that, um, uh, people could be spiritual. Uh, and, and I think the one thing that really separates those things for me is that loneliness generally is not a choice, right? But solitude can be a choice and many times is a choice. That's how, kind of how I think of that in the same way that Mitch does. Yeah, if I could just one, one more piece to that. Just imagine sitting at the table with like the lunch table with your friends or a group of people or you're, uh, you know, at a party and you're being talked over, not heard, unseen. You're in a group of people, but you feel alone. You feel lonely. That's what loneliness is. So Kristen Radke in this book makes the argument that we are more lonely than ever. Um, especially as Americans, we are more lonely than ever. And so I want to dig into some of the reasons for that. And, and all of you have mentioned um, the pandemic, that it's something that we have been experiencing, um, continue to experience in some ways. So, um, and that obviously had this moment of social isolation for everyone. So how did that social isolation um, impact our feelings of loneliness and how might it still be impacting people's feelings of loneliness? So I think even before the pandemic started, we were seeing epidemic proportions of loneliness. Um, there is a really um, like well-known book written by Dr. Putnam, um, and it was written back in the 90s. And he was talking about an epidemic of loneliness way back in the 1990s. And he was comparing our life back then to uh, the life of people from the 1940s and 50s and 60s. And that since the 40s and 50s, we've been moving to become more and more isolated. Um, we don't do as many group things. There aren't as many group activities. Uh, community organizations have just seen a continual decline year after year. It doesn't matter what organization you're talking about. You see a decline year after year as we've moved more into our own little bubbles, our, our apartments, our you know, nuclear families. And we've gotten busy, really, really busy. Okay, And yes, we are all busy. But if you break down your 24-hour day and think about, well, what am I really spending time on? A lot of our day, can I borrow this? Yeah, go ahead. Is doing this. Put it out there on purpose. Or have it. Right. OK. Um, and we're just looking, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. How many of you guys spend hours per day on your phone? Hours, come on. OK. Um, and is that time that you're connecting with others, or are you just really looking at what others are doing and what others are posting? Okay, and so, you know, even before the phone, you know, uh, Dr. Putnam talked about the television. Like, for his book, remember, it's 90s, it was, his television was a great evil. Um, you know, and, and he said, since television, people, you know, gravitated towards just wanting to be alone with the television. Do you guys have any idea why we might like to prefer to be alone with the television or our phone? Do you guys, can you guys think about why we might prefer that? Yeah. We, we have more control over it, right? We can choose what we see. And you guys, looking at a screen, looking at a television is not as complicated. Uh, we don't have to do as much stuff, you know, as actually going physically out and being with other people, okay? It, it's, it's, there's a lot more to do. There's a lot more what we call like, 
friction in our environment, you know, things that are little, small things that are stopping us from going out. So I think that this was a change that started decades ago. And we were already at epidemic proportions. You know, it depends on what, um, you know, uh, survey you're looking at. But right now, you guys, we're looking at about 50%, about 50% of Americans say they feel lonely on a somewhat regular basis. That's half of us, half of us, okay? Um, and again, <clears throat> you know, we were feeling lonely before the pandemic. The pandemic certainly made it worse. We saw about a 7% rise during the pandemic in terms of people reporting chronic loneliness. Um, and we're still pretty far up there. Yeah, with the uh, pandemic, right, Just focusing on the aspect of um, how did the social isolation, you know, uh, uh, impact the feelings of loneliness. Really what it comes down to is filling space meaningfully. You know, if you're kind of just, you're not sure what to do with yourself. And during that time, we were not allowed to do many of the things that we enjoyed and how we filled our days on a regular basis. So some of us, I, I kind of lumped it into I would suggest it like to my, to my wife or anyone who would listen, I'd be like, you know, I think people are going to reflect back on the pandemic and they're going to either look, honestly, like, you know, for lack of a better word, favorably on one aspect or just be disheartened. And it's going to come down to which side of the coin they felt they were on. And that is like, were you a producer or a consumer during that time? Did you produce something? Did you find something meaningful? Did you be able to engage, create, do something, you know, as far as your identity, maintain that sense of identity, even though all the things you used to do were no longer available to you? Or did you consume, right? Did you finish Netflix? You know, did you run through every binge thing that you did, you know, and, and feel like afterwards, you know, if you found meaning in it, then that's great. But if you found like emptiness at the end of it, you felt the loneliness. Like if you felt just bad about yourself, oh my gosh, I just like watched four hours of TV and now what? You know, that is the difference. Like that's gonna be, I think what the social isolation did, it, it prevented us from having uh, a lot of the things that we defined ourselves by, a lot of the meaning in our lives was kind of thwarted that effort and we had to create new meaning and were you able to create it? And I'm talking about the individual here who actually had a family to live with. What if you were alone? What if you had um, no TV? Not everyone has, can afford you know, so, uh, streaming services. I mean, I can only imagine what that individual, the experience and the loneliness, the social isolation, and how to even fill that space in that time. So I think it really did make us change um, you know, what is meaningful to us. And we see it with the, the great resignation. People realize, I need meaning in my life. I'm not just gonna work because I'm supposed to do these things. I want to make sure that it's meaningful and it contributes to a better thing because ultimately in the end, it's me and this stuff. Anything could be taken away. As I was prepping for this, uh, for this panel discussion, I was, I was looking to see if I could read any research. I was thinking, have things gotten worse? Have people felt lonelier since the pandemic? Like, did the, did the pandemic increase loneliness? Tish, I think that was one of, the, one of the prompt questions for us to look at. So I was reading some research and I found a, I found a study that, uh, that was just published um, as I was researching this topic. The Harvard Graduate School of Education, right? Um, uh, they, they, they ran a study in October of 2020, which was uh, seven months. The, the pandemic like, officially started, you know, what, March? With when all the schools closed? So, right? Right, March 16th. So October of 2020, um, they ran a survey that indicated uh, they found that 36% uh, of those people that were surveyed said that they were feeling seriously lonely or lonely all the time every day. Um, what was even more alarming, though, as I kept reading, is that 61% of the young people that they interviewed, so the people between the ages of 18 and 25, 61% of them said that they felt very, very lonely. So it seemed like they felt even lonelier than people who were older. So it hit those people harder. And, and, and so half of the people in the study reported that they're lonely. They, they indicated that you know after the pandemic, like very few people even took the time for just a few minutes to ask me how I was doing. And like very few people genuinely cared. And I, and I thought about that, like why would that be? Why would people feel so isolated? Why would nobody check in on other people? And so what I kind of came up with and, and from what I read and from what I was thinking about 
is that I, I think one of the reasons people weren't communicating with each other uh, or maybe not that concerned with their social relationships is because they were more concerned about their safety during that time. Keeping masks on, keeping social distance, avoiding gatherings, avoiding talking to people so droplets didn't get into people's noses and mouths, um, and staying in their houses, avoiding the spreading of disease. And frankly, I think people were just avoiding people so they themselves didn't get sick. Uh, and so, and I think a lot of people were glued to the news during that time and were distracted. Um, so as a result, relationships went by the wayside. And Tish, we talked yesterday briefly that, you know, we, we, you know, we want to mitigate the spreading of disease, right? right? And I get that, right? But our relationships are going to suffer as a result of that. But you also, you know, have to stop the disease too. But uh, in, my, in my personality class, we looked at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, and we Sorry, Troy. And most people cared about their physiological needs and their safety needs right before the uh, social needs took place. And I think, uh, uh, I think we saw that a lot. And so, um, and maybe because it, between the ages of 18 and 25, that's a particular time where people are like moving from their original families and connecting to people that are not your family. And people were robbed of that experience for two years, a crucial time where people are supposed to make connections with other people. And so I think maybe that's why it hit younger people harder, because maybe they don't have those connections that like older people do. And so you were taken away, like you didn't have that chance for those two years because you were locked away at home. So maybe that's why they felt more lonely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, you hit on um, the way it, it's impacting different, different people at different ages. And I definitely want to come back to that, especially like young people and how young people have managed through the pandemic um, and managed that so social isolation. Um, but all of you have mentioned um, just like the ways we try to avoid or the ways we might be avoiding people or avoiding connection. Um, and how that's all tied to technology. Um, so I just want to dig in a little bit deeper. I know you've talked about it a little bit. I don't want to like spend too much time if, if we want to move on. But I do want to kind of return to this idea of phone, social media, um, and how that might impact our, our feelings of isolation and loneliness. Yeah, so I think one thing with being on social media is that we put our best face forward, typically, on social media. So when you pull up your social media account and you look at others around you, one, one message that we often get is we incorrectly assume that others are not lonely. We look around at what everybody else is doing, and again, they're posting themselves being happy, out with friends, and out doing all of these things, or doing productive things, or doing, you know, beautiful things. And we assume that they're, that they're not lonely and there's something wrong with us, okay? Um, and of course, you guys know when you post, you're not going to post yourself crying in bed under the covers. Um, you know, so we're not seeing the loneliness that's out there. And I think that makes us feel even more alone. So that's, that's one thing with social media. You know, two more quick things with social media. One is that uh, social media does pull us away from being with other people face to face. And so you're not getting practice, you know interpreting other people's facial expressions and body language in real time. We, got, we get out of practice. And then that makes us more anxious when we are in face-to-face -face interactions. I know all of us, when we were preparing for this, we had talked about how our students, and I, I don't know if you guys feel this way, but generally our students are coming in with more social anxiety. You know, when I ask students about social anxiety, many of them say, yeah, I, I have social anxiety. I feel anxious when I'm around other people. And I do think some of that is social media kind of related uh, because when you're on social media, you can, you can really uh, dig into your post and think, you know, like craft it perfectly before you, you know, post it. And um, in, when you're with other people in real time, you're having to respond more quickly in real time and you're having to read other people's body language and their facial expressions. And when you're out of practice, that's hard to do, okay? And it just feels safer and easier to be able to put time into your post and have that be your public face as opposed to trying to manage yourself in real time that creates then more anxiety. 
The last thing I wanted to say is that when we have more anxiety, and a lot of people do experience more anxiety when they're on social media more and they're seeing what other people are doing, what they're not, and they feel more isolated, is that when you have more anxiety, you tend to become more defensive. Okay? So when that part of your brain signals fight or flight and you're super anxious, um, you're not fully thinking things through and you're reacting more defensively. When we react more defensively, we interpret other people's behavior as more of a threat in more of a negative way. And as a result, we have a harder time um, making friends, keeping friends, relating to other people in a positive way because we often assume that the other person is you know, potentially a threat or potentially harmful. Um, and so we might, you know, someone might not text us back, for instance, and we assume that they hate us and that something terrible is going on and that it's the end of our friendship when maybe they just forgot to text you back. Um, and that's what I mean by more of a defensive stance. If you then respond back like, hey, why didn't you text me back? You're a jerk, you know, and you go off on that person, then, then they are, then they are going to step back and they're going to say, whoa, Oh, something's going on with this person. I don't think I want to hang out with them anymore. So it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think, unfortunately, sometimes social media is kind of a starting point for that anxiety and that cycle. Yeah. Um, I'm definitely not, no Luddite here. You know, I mean, I, I, I appreciate technology, and I think it's a uh, very valuable thing. But, you know, as I'm looking around here, and uh, even, you know, like I'm, you know, Part of the problem half the time. Um, the technology, the access to technology just uh, affords you the opportunity to not be present, right? So you're sitting in this room, but you're on your phone, you're doing something else. You're not in this moment. You're not in the space where the actual, re like in real life is happening. And it allows you to disconnect. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a piece that allows you to disconnect. And then we have these two fronts that we're trying to kind of manage. We have this augmented reality, this virtual life that we're upholding, and then the one that's in front of me. It's to the point now that if my phone rings, it's, which I have, it's, I assume it's one of two things. One, if it's even possible, I assume it's a butt dial mistake. Or two, if it's not my daughter's ringtone asking for money. That's pretty much the only time I assume <laughs> it's, it's a call, right? You know, otherwise, I assume there's going to be a text. We just don't really converse in this way anymore. It, that face-to-face -face interaction, that eye contact. In fact, I, you know, I've shared this story with a couple of my classes, and it just reminds me of, like, you know, like what technology can do. And, and I think you've all heard this before. And I was, this is over the summer, and I was sitting in a coffee shop. And, uh, you know, there's a little bit of anecdotal, like, my mind reading that's going on here. But um, there were these, uh, you know, high school just, you know, the, the year just ended. It was the beginning of summer. And there were these six young ladies sitting in uh, the coffee shop. And, uh, you know, the next thing I know, like, they're kind of giggly, and, the, and, and I got the sense that, like, one of the, what, what happened was they used the technology, the, there were these five girls, and um, what they did was they created a group chat, um, but they left one of the girls off that was in the room, that was sitting with them. And uh, the girl did not necessarily know what to do, because I don't necessarily know, again, this is me, uh, you know, mind reading here, and, and, and armchairing what she was thinking or feeling at that time, or what the dynamics were, but I don't necessarily know she had somewhere else to go. You know, like, I don't, I, like, this was her friend group and this was it. And so she tried to fill the space by getting up, going to the bathroom. And when she came back, you know, like, at this point, I'm just kind of like, you know, yeah, it could have been like the creepy old man, I don't know. But I'm like, I noticed she was visibly crying. Like, she went to the bathroom, was crying, come back. And then the other girls kind of giggled. And then she kind of sat down, finished, like, whatever she was eating, whatever it was, and then, uh, and then just eventually left, decided to leave. And you could see her as she walked by, she was crying again. And then the other girls, like, kind of murmured, like, oh, my God, could you believe that, you know, type of thing. And so the technology is something there that can actually put up another barrier and isolate other people and then exacerbate the feelings of loneliness that we have. So the technology is, is there. I mean, it's, it's the, the social media is good. I mean, I think for a lot of people, especially if you were in the group that didn't have, you, didn't, you lived alone, I think it was a, it was, it was a lifeline right? To, to connect and, and see people. I, I can connect with my kid who lives in, you know, in, in college and doesn't live here. Um, you know, it's, it's a nice thing to do. So I, I think there's a lot of, you know, uses for it, but it also prevents us from being in this moment where we're not able to connect with the people in front of us and then gives us that feeling of, oh my gosh, they don't even want to be with me. I'm boring. I start to mind read you. 
Like, if I'm in class and you're on your phone, I'm like, oh, man, I guess that lecture sucked. You know, like, they don't even want to listen to this. I don't want to hear, oh, I must be bad. I must be something else. Versus, like, you know, so I, so I think the technology puts up the barrier and, and enables, and I don't want to monopolize here, but I think it, it, it gets us to start to feel that I'm not worthy of the attention of this person in front of me and then starts to maybe creep in, like, lower the self-esteem of the individual. That's not true, Mitch. You're the best. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. No, no, no. I mean, <laughs> um, I'm going to echo what both of you said. I think technology, especially our phones, can be good, can be good and bad. I was on a panel discussion a couple years ago uh, that looked at relationships, and I'm going to talk about that study that I talked about a couple years ago again. Um, your phones, there's a study that indicates that your phones can be harmful to your to your dating relationship. Um, I, th I mean, it's nice to have a phone. You could shoot a quick text, to check in with people. Uh, this past summer, I was overseas, and I left the wedding at 3 a.m., and it was, I was in the forest up in the mountains, pitch black, and the thought hit me. Like, if my car battery was dead, like, I wouldn't be able, like, like who would be able to help me? But I had my phone with me, and I was the only, one of the only ones in my group that had a working telephone at the time. So you could still communicate in the sense of an emergency. Have you ever had to use your phone in an emergency situation? Like, it's nice to have that because, you know, before phones, uh, you'd have to wait on, this, on the roadside for a police officer to notice you and to come up. So it's helpful in those aspects. But, um, but the problem is that, it, like, like we've mentioned, it's hard to put them down when we're at home, when we're in class, especially sometimes when we're with other people that we care about. So the study that I had read about was from 2016. I don't know if you want to jot it down. Um, the, the, the professors that wrote the study, are the last names are McDaniel and Coyne, C-O-Y-N-E. And uh, they wanted to see if distractions affected people's relationships. Um, they, uh, they came up with a word in the study called technoference. <laughs> I, I know, a play on the word of interference, right? And, uh, and so 143 married or cohabitating women were in this study, and uh, they asked them about their partner's use of technology when you're together with your partner, right? And the majority of the women in the study perceived that technology, computers, cell phones, smartphones, you know, TV or whatever, frequently interrupted their intimate interactions. Um, when they spend time together, when they were conversing, when they were at dinner, when they're out with each other, when they're in the car, and I was kind of surprised to read this part, and I don't mean to be weird or anything, but like some people were checking their phones during sexual activities, uh, and especially afterwards, you know? I mean, I don't know how I'd feel about that. That's not very warm. <laughs> but uh, so, I don't know if that happens to anybody here. I don't mean to, answer that, to ask that question, you know? But like, like if you feel like people are on their phone when they're with you, right, it causes a sense of disconnection. And so you have to make, you know, I'm not, I'm not surprised sometimes that, you know, uh, to read that being on your phone makes the, make, can make your partner more depressed, especially if you look back at the definition that we used in the beginning of this talk, where if loneliness is translated into feeling emotionally disconnected from people and feeling like people don't care about you, the phone can be a catalyst to that, especially in a relationship. And so... Uh, so anyway, that was from a 2016 study. So what do we do? I guess you just got to put your phone down, especially during certain times, you know, to, to not make your partner feel like that. So, but yeah, there's a lot of research that indicates, I mean, technology is awesome, right? It, it, it saved my life in many ways, but uh, it has that downside. All right, we're all going to be a little bit more cautious about how we use our phones. <laughs> Take away one for sure. Thank you for that. Um, so yeah, the technology is interfering with our way, uh, with our ability to connect with each other. We had social isolation from the pandemic, um, but um, kind of getting back to this idea that we've been lonely for a lot longer than just the last couple of years. Um, and the book really focusing on this idea of American loneliness. I wanted to get your perspective um, a little bit about some of the social structures and maybe the ways that American society is built to like keep us lonely or like what the particular problems are with within our social structures that might might be causing some of that so so I think that um, you know one way to think about this is that um, we are a social species you know we have evolved to be a social species um, 
we work best in groups, and that's the way our brains are wired. Um, and, and a lot of neuroscientists will argue that the reason why we have all this cerebral cortex up here is to navigate social relationships. Um, because again, we work best as a collective, that there's this drive to be with others. Um, that's stayed the same. Like that's still in us. It's still in our wiring. It's still how our brain is set up, still in our genes. But our environment has shifted. And, you know, I think it shifted everywhere it, with industrialization. I don't think it's just America, but I, I think that it has shifted even maybe more so in extremely individualistic cultures like the United States, um, where the emphasis is on be your best self, be your best you. You know, the focus is on you can do it on your own, and if you need help, there's something wrong with you. You need to do it on your own. Um, the focus on single family homes, the focus on, again, you know, doing it by yourself. Um, I think all of those things, so like the, the, the structure and the environment has changed dramatically from what we evolved in. You know, again, we evolved to live in groups, not just family groups, but, you know, groups of, of 20, 30, 40 people at a time in a, in a small community. That's what we evolved for. Um, and, you know, we are finding ourselves in much, much smaller groups and many of us um, completely by ourselves. Uh, I read a stat that a half a million people here in the United States go five to six days regularly without talking to anyone. A half a million. Um, that is, yeah, that is a lot of people. Um, so I think that while our, our wiring and our genes have not changed, our structure has. Um, and the strong push for being able to do it by yourself in individualism, not relying on the group, um, makes it worse. You know, there's this contradiction between what our, our brain and body kind of needs versus what our society says we should be doing. I think it depends on the country that you live in, too. I mean, not every country is like that. I guess some might call the United States uh, an individualistic society, but, you know, Mediterranean countries, uh, some parts of the Caribbean, smaller islands, smaller communities tend to be more collectivists, right, and, and value the social network that they have. And, uh, and so, again, I really think it depends on, on you know, on, on where you live. I, I would have to imagine, Laura, that... Like more high, the more highly industrialized the society is, the more individualistic it's mm -hmm. going to be, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, the less industrialized it is, the more collectivist it's going to be. I mean, I've never traveled anywhere outside of the country other than the country that my family comes from, and they come from the, they come from the country of Greece. Uh, and so in Athens, my cousins and family, they're more individualistic because they're working all the time and, you know, they're really busy. But uh, on the island that my family lives from, uh, that where they live at, it's much more collectivist, right? And you know, people kind of rely on each other to help each other out. And so it depends. I mean, the, in, in the personality course that, that many of my students are, are uh, in the audience are here for, uh, Dr. Adler, we learned, talks about how a social interest, right, is kind of developed within us. And, you know, and uh, it's one of the things that drives our personality. But, but Dr. Adler lived in a in a collectivist society a long time ago. I think if he lived if he lived in the United States today, he might have some different ideas. So it depends on the depends on the country that you come from too, because not everywhere is the same. I think uh, Western society is structured to reinforce disengagement for the most part. Um, oh, man. You know, it, with all that's it's so demanding, uh, honestly, that I think it's hold on. Let me just check this text. I just got to respond to this. It's a twenty four seven work environment expectation. Um, even like with like social media, like if someone responds to you, the expectation is you're going to reply back within a certain interval, right? And so there is a demand that we are distracted and disconnected. Um, I, I think it's a, a variety of ways, though, that this happens. I mean, you know, one thing that really bothers me, um, honestly, about like, uh, you know, like, like kind of the, a newer concept that's come into the vernacular, at least that I've become aware of in the last like handful of years, is like promote your brand. You know, like that is, there's nothing more individualistic than like you're your own brand and you got to promote that thing and no one's going to do it but you. And, and like, that's like basically saying that you've got to go ahead and make, put forth that best, 
image uh, of whatever it is because this is who you're selling. You're always selling, you know, and like instead of being. And it's like, it's, it's a, it, it kind of feeds into the whole consumer mentality and consumption base of Western culture that says, you know, we roll through things quickly. You know, like there's like, you know, like I, it, it's not about like a long lasting, it's about, you know, consumption and getting through and, and moving on to the next thing and, and making sure that you're, you're, whatever it is you're selling, you know, and you're constantly, in, you know, like, like uh, the, the goal is for you to always be on. And I think that's part of one of the issues, like, you know, that we are promoting our own brand instead of like, you know, kind of like a societal value. I don't know. But also with that too, with the technology piece, you know, I also think a big issue too, which is again, a, a Western or an American, and I don't think this necessarily is just Western, um, and a, but mostly American too, but it's like, is the inability for emotional regulation that individuals have. And I believe that this kind of goes with the idea that you've been, that we're not required to be alone with our thoughts. Because like I'm looking at the, the book in the very back there, The Candy House by Jennifer Egan. It's like the sec second book on the left there. Read that book. It's an amazing book. You should grab it. And it's like in there, I'm reminded of one of the, one of the <laughs> quotes that she read in there, that she wrote in there. And it's like she, she's describing someone in the 70s. And this guy is at this house. And he's a little uncomfortable with himself. He doesn't know what to do because he doesn't know these people. He's kind of wandering around. He's trying to fill the space. And then she makes the, discre the, 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 like the distinction back to present day. And she says where uh, a person today would just go on their phone, find something, some echo chamber that would validate who they think they are and reassure them that they're okay, right? But when you're with the use of phones, like we're always being able to distract ourselves. I don't have to think for myself. I don't have to like be bored. I don't have to come up with a creative solution. I'm not required to do this because I can be distracted until like the next thing comes along. And I think that's one of the problems with Western society is that we, we've, we've, technology has allowed parents to let their children be independent too fast in a sense. Like I can throw this, like it started with the, uh, going to grandma's house with a DVD player. You know, you couldn't stare out the window for 30 minutes without annoying the heck out of me. So I got to put on something in front of you to distract you because you're incapable of thinking for yourself. And that's the learned behavior. How can you sit alone with yourself and think? and come up with a creative thought to solve boredom, to solve loneliness, to solve the crisis of what am I doing? Where am I, how, how am I belonging and connecting? Because you know what? This thing is gonna distract me and not, it's gonna, I'm gonna connect with this, this blue hue. You know, this is the thing. And then, you know, that, that's like an attachment pattern too. We developed the attachments too. I was supposed to be on that panel too in love with our phones, but I think I ended up with COVID. It was February of that time. So I, had, I was sick and I had to back out at that last moment. I don't know if it was the flu or COVID, but, um, and that was one of the things that we have these attachments to this stuff and it's unhealthy. It's unhealthy that this is what I, you know, part of my identity. This is how I cope. This is how I feel comfort. Mm -hmm. and, and it's making it harder to relate in the individual, so. It disallows you from being bored. I was in a, a, a class and they were studying the connection between boredom and creativity and this just reminds me of that, that like when you don't have space to, to think and to be alone and be comfortable with being alone, you also right, lose out on all of that creative potential and possibility. That's um, why solitude's important. Right, yeah. right. Um, but that, that can be hard to sit with if you're not comfortable with it. Um, so the next question I think um, we'll, see, we'll see what you all have to say. Um, I'm curious about the way different generations experience loneliness and manage those feelings. And you've all kind of touched on this a little bit, um, just with generation gaps with technology, um, but maybe some things that you've witnessed in your classes with students um, who are, all of you are a different generation than we are for sure, or clients or folks that are older. Um, is, there, is there a range of loneliness experiences that you can speak to? I could speak briefly to, uh, you know, I, I see, sometimes I see a lot of older people who've lost family members. And so, I mean, I think just the natural progression of life, as, you, as people get older, uh, your friend groups start to dissipate, right? People start getting busy with their families, so you don't see each other as often. And then family becomes like your major social outlet, right? And so people start getting disconnected. And then as you get even older, those people then start to move away. They start to pass, so they start to pass. And then you know, I see clients sometimes in their 70s and 80s who really don't have anybody left. And it's sad, like they look forward to coming to see me in session because I'm like one of the only ones who actually 
listens to them and talks to them and connects with them. And so uh, I think it, you know you could look at an Eric you can look at it in an Ericksonian view and see that you know uh, the, the ages of like 18 to 30 right is when we're supposed to be connecting with people and then and then I really think from 30 and beyond those connections start to kind of die off. And then especially when you get much much older like. I was joking with my class this this morning, like, you know, I love going to rock and roll concerts because I find a sense of community there, right? And if I'm 90 and I don't have any friends left, I mean, I'm going to, legit, I'm going to take my wheelchair and I'm going to Uber to a rock and roll concert. <laughs> and I'm going to be in there and I'm going to be with the community. And I mean, I, I suppose that's going to be one of my safeguards. Maybe they'll even lift me up and body surf me. <laughs> nice. But so I, I think... That's what I see in, in session, at least, that the older that people get, the more disconnected they become because you just don't have anybody to connect with anymore. And it, it's sad. It's a sad reality. Sorry. Okay. Um, a couple things with the different generations, right, for the uh, experiencing of loneliness. I mean, we all know that uh, correlation is in causation, right, but we're seeing that there is... Uh, an uptick. We, we do know that there is an association with feelings of, um, with, with loneliness and the use of substances. So as, fee, as people feel more alone or lonely, they tend to rely on something that's going to help them change their plane of thought. So we're seeing more marijuana use, more alcohol uh, use, uh, you know, recreationally and then also as a coping mechanism, which is not a healthy coping mechanism, but nonetheless a coping mechanism. <laughs> um, and we're also seeing since 2010, you know, which is definitely before the pandemic, but we're seeing uh, increases in self-harm, depression, suicide, um, you know, of all the, of the younger age groups. Now, I don't know. that The interesting thing about the 2010 piece is that that's also the rise of social media. And, and again, correlation isn't causation, but, you know, there's something there that we're seeing all of these um, feelings of anxiety and depression and then these ultimately even behaviors that are leading to potential increases in suicide you know, at the same time as the rise of these things. So how are young people coping with this? Um, I think it's really stressful on them right now. I think anxiety is all time high. Uh, the social piece is difficult, uh, you know, and, and I think that's why we're seeing the increase in the need for mental health services. And right now that's a bit of a crisis that there's not enough people to go around. People are on waiting lists to actually help them cope with this. Again, it goes with the emotional regulation and having the support of others, uh, a friend group that you can rely on that's going to sit in front with you. And just the support of networks are dissipating. The closeness that we feel is not there. So I think we're reaching. I think we're trying to find. That's how young people are coping. A couple of stats, though, like a third of people over 45 um, feel lonely, right? So 45 and, old, 45 and older, you know, which is probably all your parents, um, you know, is a third of them are lonely. And, and about a quarter of the people who are uh, 65 or older, they feel socially isolated. And we know that older, America, older adults, especially Western culture Americans, are you know, at high risk for isolation and loneliness. So how is it affecting them is that it's becoming more widespread. It's becoming more widespread and it's becoming more apparent in the fact that we're, there's not enough therapists to go around. People are trying to find ways to cope and they're not they're not there. They're just not available to them. So I wish I had an answer. I'm just making the observations of how the different generations, at least I see. And I've seen one last piece of anecdotal evidence is this, is that in my classes the last couple of years, I teach psychology so people disclose things sometime, from time to time in the class and, the, and in their writing. And I would say that I've seen, again, anecdotal, um, is that my students, you know, in the past couple of years have reported more periods of loneliness. Like, this is not a foreign thing. And, and, I'm, and I'm not, you know, and again, sorry, to, uh, I don't know if I'm, you know, uh, getting myself in trouble here, but it's like, I'm, I'm even reading it more from, like, individuals who I would, like, quote, unquote, like, won high school. You know, they were very popular, had a lot of friends, you know, like, they, they're experiencing loneliness, too, bouts. It's like, it's, it is truly, you know, widespread, and, and it, is, uh, it is being felt by everybody. Um, and I don't think it's uh, discriminating against age right now. College isn't set up like high school, though, you know, where you get to see each other kind of every day and you have clubs and activities and whatnot. You know, people kind of go their own way. Psychology club. Yeah, you come <laughs> to psych club, sure. <laughs> well, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I would agree with with what you all have said. Um, I have absolutely seen um, an increase in my classes. Um, I've been teaching since, gosh, for a long time, um, since 1997. And um, since that time, I've seen a, a rapid decline in the amount that students talk to each other and the amount of comfort that students find in being able to converse. Um, when I look out at my classes in the morning, you know, and everybody's getting ready or, you know, you're waiting 10 minutes before class starts, what is everyone doing? Everyone's on their phone. Um, and, and that's what's comfortable, right? Like that's easier than, you know, turning to the person next to you and saying, hey, how'd you do on the last test? Or, you know, what do you think of this assignment? Or what'd you get back on your paper? It's just easier to be on your phone. Um, one of the stats that I read, and, and you know, COVID did not make it easier, COVID made it a lot harder. One of the stats that I read was that nine in 10 college um, experienced mental health difficulties related to COVID. So reported that they were feeling anxiety, significant anxiety or depression connected to COVID. And that most of those students then felt that that was impacting their ability to concentrate and pay attention and get assignments done in class. Um, and not all of that is connected to loneliness, but I think a, a decent amount is connected to feeling lonely and isolated. One other thing with that, like in the book, it talks about a psychological study and Harry Harlow's and the study of the rhesus monkeys. And I'm not saying a word of that study. But we do know that when we experience periods of social isolation, it's we're, we don't know how to connect. We don't know how to relate to other people. So when I'm put in a room, I might be socially awkward. And I think we have a lot of, I mean, the, a lot of college age students, I mean, if you really talk about the social isolation, and if you were part of that, you know, if your family kind of followed what most of us did, if you're a freshman now, you were what, a junior in, in high school? you know, like these formative years of like, you know, like probably just came out of puberty, you're having your glow up, you know, and everything else. And it's like, you know, you're missing out that moment, you know, and it's like, and now, now you're put into a group of people and you're like, how do I connect with you? How do I, all that time, you know, like talking about Erickson and identity achievement and, and formation, and you don't really have a sense of who you are. And, and now it's like, you're an awkward kid again. You know, uh, all of us, you know, I mean, it's like we have to reintegrate and relearn how to be with like strangers and, you know, and, uh, and, and be able to make a connection where I, you know, like I, I was like, just, you know, just as a own study, like sometimes I'll just walk around in my neighborhood with my dog and I just don't want to talk to people. So I just put headphones in, you know, and then no one approaches me because I have a headphone, you know, like that, because even if I'm listening to nothing, because I just want to be alone with my thoughts and it's a way of saying, don't talk to me right now. You know, uh, these are the things, and, 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 and like, it's also a safety net, right? You, I see people walking in the hallways with, uh, you know, their AirPods in all the time, headphones on, and you may be listening to nothing, but it's also a way of, it's also a coping strategy of isolation. Like, you know, when you're walking, or when you're like, I'm busy, I'm doing something. Even though you're doing nothing, it's a way of protection. And I think these are the way we cope with it. I think, you know, by, by, bringing environment with us. And you can listen to music, you can listen to things. And then the one thing is it, it also prevents you from being present because you're bringing in music, you're bringing in sound, you're filling your environment with something other, with what you want versus what's right in front of you. But I, I truly believe that the isolation caused us a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, some of the things we have to relearn. And one of them is social connection, um, choosing kind, you know, being, you know, uh, just, just being there for people. One thing that um, you all are making me think about is um, how loneliness might be a terrible feeling that we are, we have right now, but there are ways in which sometimes it's easier to hold on to that um, than to like actually make the effort to, to connect. Um, and so to kind of like help us think about why maybe we want to move out of these feelings of loneliness, um, I was hoping you can talk a little bit about the impact of loneliness on our health and well-being, that it's not just a feeling that we're having, but it's actually something that, that might be impacting us on a, on a more physical level even. Yeah, so um, loneliness absolutely impacts our physiology. It impacts our brain. It impacts our health. Uh, it impacts our cognitive abilities as well. So 
being chronically lonely is about as bad for your health as smoking about 15 cigarettes per day. Okay, so it's, it's bad for your health. Um, we know that it suppresses the immune system. We know it puts you at increased risk for cardiovascular disease and stroke. Um, it increases risk of obesity. It increases risk of dementia. Um, they've even seen that it, it worsens your antibody response to vaccines. So you go in and get a COVID booster. Feeling lonely is going to make that vaccine less effective. Isn't that crazy? So there's a very definite physiological effect that goes throughout the body, and that seems to be connected to the stress response. The stress response is starting in the brain. So you've also got this impact on the brain itself. Um, so what they have found is that we've got this kind of low level chronic inflammation in the body and in the brain that seems to be connected and caused uh, by loneliness. So this chronic loneliness causes a chronic inflammation with all of the ill health effects that goes with that and all of the health effects on the brain that goes with that as well. Another thing in the brain that happens is that we see a decline in the ability of the brain to produce and respond to dopamine. Dopamine makes you feel good, okay? So you get a dopamine hit that feels good. Um, one of the primary ways that we get dopamine hits uh, is by social interactions, you know, having a good social interaction, feeling like other people like us and want to be around us. When we feel chronically lonely, that response, that physiological response in our brain is muted. So it doesn't feel as good to be with other people when we're chronically lonely. And then all of this, it, you know, impacts our cognitive ability to think about this stuff as well. And like I talked about before, we get stuck in kind of a self-perpetuating cycle of we, we get defensive, you know, we feel like we're kind of under stress, we're under attack we interpret other people's behavior in a negative way. We assume that they're not gonna like us. So we behave in unlikable ways and go figure then they don't like us. Then we get upset about that and angry about that. And it's just this cycle that continues. Um, so all of those things are wrapped up in loneliness. I read about a study uh, during the weekend from New Zealand that was published last year that indicated that uh, People who felt isolated were not likely of getting good sleep. Uh, they, uh, the researchers looked at about 104,000 people within a six-year period, and uh, they found that uh, if you live by yourself, you're more likely of suffering from insomnia. If you, feel, if you live with people and you still feel lonely, you're more likely of having hypersomnia. You're more likely of sleeping more. Um, and so, Laura, you talked about that damaging your immune system, and sleep has been shown to help to restore the immune system and keep people healthy. So if they're not sleeping, it's going to cause them more damage, which then leads to other stuff. So if you're interested in reading that study, uh, it's uh, the McLay, uh, M-C-L-A-Y, and Jameson's study, uh, J-A-M-I-E-S-O-N. So if you type in McLay, Jameson, sleep, you'll, you'll find that study. Um, and then I, I looked at a, a study that's about 10 years old from a professor named Shankar, S-H-A-N-K-A-R, uh, that uh, looked at individuals that are lonely, their blood pressure was increased, uh, the, uh, something called C-reactive protein, which is a sign of inflammation in the body that you talked about, um, and also uh, fibrinogen levels, which uh, make you more likely to have blood clots. Uh, and, and those things are all correlated with people that are lonely too, which then leads to heart disease and whatnot. So, um, and I know there's a pretty famous study, Laura, we had talked about that uh, briefly, Dr. Cassiopo from the University of Chicago and Dr. Hockley uh, from 2003 uh, wrote a famous study that's been cited like in thousands of textbooks that have, uh, that, that's kind of showed that too. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty bad for people. Um, so what can I say? Um, it does. It, it, you know, I'd like to be optimistic, folks, but I like to be realistic, too. It, it comes with a heavy physical cost and psychological cost, unfortunately. So if you do have people around you that, uh, that seem lonely or you feel like you know, reaching out to somebody, like, it, really probably, it will help them, and especially the older people in your lives, too. I mean, they really do appreciate being checked in on. Uh, it makes them feel less lonely. You could be saving your lives. Well, um 
given that advice, um, maybe we can wrap up with some positive ways to cope with loneliness. You've all talked on talked about some of the like coping mechanisms that aren't so healthy. So maybe um, we can talk about some of the coping mechanisms that might be, might be healthy. Um, and also just how we make our lives less lonely. How do we move away from this uh, culture of loneliness that we find ourselves in? And we'll try. There's, there's one part from the book that I'll just kind of quote it. It says, the premise that one is only lonely when she thinks she is, is true. But since loneliness is a state of mind, which doesn't always correlate with aloneness, that bus trip might not solve any problems. So kind of the way I process that, and that's, I'm not sure what page that's on, but uh, 40, 243, if anyone's looking at the book. But the, the way I kind of process that is that we're a little bit powerless, right? The power of loneliness is that, you know, to lessen the feeling, we have to like change our mindset versus our situation necessarily. But one of the strategies keeping it positive is like, how do we do that, right? So how can I change my mindset? How can I be in this situation? And even though whatever I, I can get up and go and I'm still feeling alone, still feeling this loneliness, what can I do? Um, there are some things that I've looked at that were, um, you know, one thing is like, honestly, like physical activity, taking a walk actually is one of the best things that almost immediately kind of alleviates that sense of loneliness because you're actually engaged with some, with a particular behavior, right? So, so how can we cope with these things? What can we do? Um, and it also allows you to, you know, kind of going back to the dog walking experience, it assuages some of the isolation you're feeling. Like if I'm alone and I don't have anywhere to go or anything to do, you know, like, uh, you know, I don't, I'm, I, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'd be like, you know, devastated if anyone saw me sitting in a coffee shop alone, so I can never do that, right? You know I mean? So maybe I could take a walk. It's an activity, and it's okay that you're alone doing that thing. It's, it, 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 you know, it allows you to actually engage in behavior and moves you from a new, to a new environment to at least oper create the opportunity. Um, you know, and then really the biggest thing is finding meaning in whatever it is you're doing. Finding meaning is the key. Hobbies that you're involved in, you know, that you like, reading books, something that is giving you a sense of that your time is, is being well spent and contributing to the identity that you want to see yourself as. So anything that you find engaging and meaningful, um, doing, uh, you know, work that's, uh, whether it's uh, formalized work or uh, doing research on your own or whatever it is, just something that you find meaningful is probably one of the best coping strategies. And because um, that way you can be alone, but not feel lonely at that moment. Folks, one of the biggest therapeutic strategies that I encourage clients to do, friends, family, or other people that bring that issue to me, uh, and it's pretty simple, is to volunteer somewhere, right? And I know for being students, your time is pretty limited because you probably have a lot of schoolwork to do. You have work that you probably to pay for school and whatnot, but volunteering is a great way to alleviate loneliness. I mean, uh, think about what you care about, right? Whether you care about working with homeless people, uh, uh, in homeless shelters, your church, your uh, religious affiliation, the culture that you belong to. Like, think about what it is that you care about, and volunteering and contributing your time uh, and your energy helps you work alongside with other people for a good cause, and you care about that thing, and you're likely of connecting with those people, like, in a meaningful kind of way. It gives you happiness, fulfillment, it reduces stress, it alleviates feelings of depression. Uh, you could connect with other people, like I said. And remember, in the beginning of our talk, where we talked about how loneliness is being cut off from other people. When you volunteer with other people for causes that you mutually care about, you're working on a, on a certain goal. When I transferred to UIC after Moraine Valley, I didn't know anybody at UIC. I can't say I felt lonely, but I wanted to connect somewhere. So I chose to volunteer at the UIC radio station. Being a music fan, <coughs> I was able to put programming together. I met a bunch of friends, people that I've kind of connected with. And I did some research work, volunteer research work at UIC about things that I cared about. And I found meaning in both of those things. And it really helped my time. And so those are things that I, that I recommend for people. And, and to piggyback, Mitch, off of what you said too, finding meaning in your interactions with people. Like I think one easy thing that you could do is whenever you're talking to somebody, try to think about like what it is to be like in their shoes as they're speaking to give you meaning of in that particular interaction that you're having that makes 
that makes your interaction more meaningful and your connection uh, um, empathetic. Of, of, yeah, empathetic and, and to have intimacy with that person. And it does. It, it alleviates feelings of loneliness when you can connect with somebody in an empathetic kind of way and showing care. So that's kind of, those are two of the pieces of advice that I would give. Num like I said, the number one big thing is I think volunteering is really a great strategy. And then trying to find meaning and empathy with the people that you're talking to as they're speaking. Think about what they're going through as they speak to you. So all of those, I think, are, are really important points. The exercise, I think, is really, really important to alleviate stress and anxiety. Um, and then volunteering, you know, uh, is, is a great practical suggestion as well. Um, another suggestion that I have is just that expectations matter. Your expectations about how things are going to go really do make a difference. Many people who are lonely assume that other people will not like them. Yep. They go into interactions right. with the right. assumption that, oh, no one's going to like me here. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really bad at making friends. I'm, I'm really bad at reading social cues. I have a lot of social anxiety. I'm not going to do well. That makes us feel more vulnerable. When we feel vulnerable, we shut down. Okay, we don't communicate as effectively. We don't react as effectively. We're not as warm. We see a decrease in empathy. We don't, you know, try to feel what the other person's feeling. We're just trying to protect ourselves. You know, think about like when you are feeling defensive, think about yourself like a porcupine. All of your spines go up and you're protecting yourself, right? That's the number one key. You can't really be protecting yourself tightly and being open and warm and caring and empathetic because when you're open and warm and caring and empathetic, it's opening you up to potential harm, okay? So people who are lonely tend to be spikes up, you know, and they, have, they assume other people aren't gonna like them and then that often, you know, results in a self-fulfilling prophecy. So expectations matter. You wanna repeat to yourself when you go into a new situation, I am likable, you know, other people will like me, uh, I'm, a, I'm an okay person, you know, I, I, I know how to interact with other people. There is this old Saturday Night Live skit, Stuart Smalley, that probably none of you have ever seen, but, you know, he psychs himself up every day and he's looking at the mirror, I like me, you know, and that's kind of silly, but, uh, you know, honestly, going into a social situation with the assumption that you are an okay person and that it is possible for other people to like you and find something in common with you is really important to go in with that mindset instead of going in with the automatic mindset that I think many people have, which is no one's going to like me. Um, another thing that's kind of connected to that is to try out, you know, it can be difficult to do that in, in like a big setting with a lot of people. So you want to practice that in small, non-threatening situations. So if you go to the convenience store or you go to the grocery store, you know, saying some small comment to someone like, oh, that's a nice shirt. You know, you don't have to be creepy about it, but like, you know, your hair looks great or, you know, uh, what are you listening to? Or, you know, some kind of small comment to connect to another person. Um, the more successes that you have, uh, the more feedback that you get from other people, the more confidence that it can give you. So extending yourself in small ways, with small bits throughout the day, can be really helpful. Laura, like you bring up one thing about the self-esteem piece that I just want to mention, uh, or the, the uh, self-fulfilling prophecy, or at least the self-fulfilling prophecy of self-esteem, is I want you to realize that the, when you have that low self-esteem or when you have that view of yourself that no one's going to want to hang out with me, you know, it protects you. I mean, you know, it works for you. We have that because it's protected you because you know what? You're thinking no one wants to, no one wants, if I reach out, no one's gonna like say, come on, join Mitch, come on and do this. So what it does is it prevents me from even sending out that text, sending out the feeler, saying, hey, what are you up to tonight? Because you know what? I didn't get rejected. I didn't send it. And by you telling me I'm busy already, I was, avo I was able to avoid the rejection. But at the same time, I was also, uh, there was never even an opportunity to even like hang out. The problem is, is the expectations is critical because if you do put yourself out there, understand that sometimes people are just legitimately busy and try again. You know, that's not, it's, it was a moment and then continue on with it. But those, 
those thoughts that prevent you from doing things, they protect you because they help you avoid those negative feelings. But they also reduce the quality of life because you never give yourself a chance. Yeah, I, I would say giving other people the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Uh, you know, so if someone doesn't respond to a text, uh, again, people who are lonely tend to make mountains out of molehills, you know, so someone doesn't respond, you automatically assume they're upset with you or they don't like you. It could be something totally different. And we often don't consider alternate explanations. Maybe they were in the middle of, of dinner, yeah. you know, so they couldn't respond right away. Maybe they were in the middle of work. There are lots of reasons why people might say no or they might not respond. Give other people the benefit of the doubt. Don't automatically assume there must be something wrong with me. In social psychology, I think a lot of us uh, who cover that chapter or who, I know you teach that class, they call that the fundamental attribution error, right? Where you overestimate uh, the personality factors of people and underestimate the situation, right? Yeah. Right, we're all out here all struggling with loneliness. We all probably have defensive mechanisms up, especially right now. So doing that outreach is really, really key. Um, thank you for the practical applications and practical suggestions. I feel like those are all things that we can take away and really use. Um, we have about seven minutes left of our time, and I wanted to turn it over to you all for any questions. Um, if you have any follow-ups for our experts up here, we can take a few minutes to do some questions. The microphone's back there, if, if you'd like it. Is it working? Do you all have any questions? Anything, any comments you want to add maybe? Maybe you want to say something? Right, if you have experiences with loneliness and have found you know, ways to move past it, that might be a really great thing I to share. I would love to hear that. Anything you say is going to be right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jana. Um, <laughs> I just feel like knowing, like finding comfort in that like other people feel lonely um, brings me like peace and like feeling less lonely. Yeah. That's about all I wanted to say. <laughs> Jana, if you left it to social media, right? you would think that like everybody's having the time of their life. But Laura, you talked about that early on in the talk that you know, if we compare ourselves to other people, I think that causes a lot of issues. And, and Mitch, that might even cause some of the self-esteem issues and self-consciousness issues if we compare ourselves. We don't know what these people are like when they're not posting. They probably have a, you know, a life as plain as anybody. We always put ourselves out the best possible version you know, having a good time out there. But uh, it's nice to know that other people feel lonely too. A lot of people do. 50%. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jana. Get one back there. Hi. Uh, I did come in a little bit late, so I'm sorry if I, like, missed this topic already being talked about. But um, so would you say that, like, for loneliness and, like, depression, that could be like mutually exclusive. I know like obviously like loneliness could be like a symptom of it, but do you think that it could eventually like lead to the depression or it has to be like you're already depressed? You can be one without the other, you know, for sure, right? Yeah. You know, you can have a period of loneliness, um, but extended loneliness typically will lead to a depression. Depressed people also feel lonely too, because if you look at, I mean, I would assume many of you are in the psychopathology class, right? The Psych 205 class. Uh, one of the hallmarks of depression is not being interested in things, right? And when you're not interested in things, you also may not seek out other people. So I think, I think depression leads to loneliness. But like Mitch said, loneliness doesn't always lead to depression, but extended loneliness certainly can. So they are linked together in that way. Um, for me, one way, because I feel like that I can't um, like go out and do something by myself, that I need somebody to go with me. Uh, for me, I feel like, because I want to go watch this one movie, but nobody wants to go by myself. So go. I was thinking of <laughs> going by myself yeah. and then, like going shopping by myself. So I'm alone, but I don't feel lonely. So that's what I was, that's one way I wanted to cope with it. Yeah. I don't mean to think for you, but Mitch mentioned it. You find meaning in that interaction. And that's one of the reasons that you probably won't 
have the negative effects of loneliness, even though you're by yourself doing something. Uh, I haven't been to a movie by myself just yet, but I want to. Like, there's going to be a rock and roll show at some point where, like, no one's ever heard of this band, and they're going to say, I, you know, I'm not going to go with you, and I'm going to go by myself, and I'm going to have a good time because I'm going to find meaning in what I'm doing. And that's one way to ward off the loneliness is finding meaning and purpose and satisfaction in what you're doing, even if you're by yourself. It, it goes with that quote I wrote, read from the book, you know, because um, you can't necessarily just go to the movies and stop feeling lonely if that were the case, right? But sometimes you've got to choose yourself because that's also part of it, saying, like, I'm choosing, this is my activity. And when you're choosing yourself, even though you're alone, it's not a sense of loneliness, right? And that's the, that's the other piece is that, and, and I think, uh, you know, having that meaning and, like, that identity that says, you know, this is, I'm choosing me for this, this moment. Having the strength to do that is pretty critical. So I applaud you for that. Yeah, that's great. And I think, you know, college was the time when I started practicing that myself. And I think that, you know, once you leave high school, once you leave like a comfort of like a particular friend group, you know, I'm not a psychologist. I don't have any expertise, but I know for myself, my experience was, you know, going out to dinner by myself or going to a movie by myself, if you choose it, is really magical. Like, it's yeah. really great. <laughs> like, it can be a lot of fun and bring meaning. And then it, and then when you are alone, you feel okay with yourself and you don't necessarily feel as lonely. So it's a good thing to practice, especially right now. We're gonna get the microphone just to make sure that our audio recording can hear it. So to my understanding, the discussion is for young adults and adults. Now, my only concern is how do we get this discussion board to younger generations, yeah. to you know, the young ones that really don't know what they're feeling, can't really express what the way they're feeling. Are there any, you know, will there be hope for kind of get what we're getting now? It's a lot of information, and I think it's great information. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, uh, that's a, a, a tough one because the younger generation, you know, even more so than you guys are, you know, online. Just went out. Um, they're online more and more, and uh, I, I think that more and more they're having a harder time reading facial expressions and being able to be in real time with other people. Um, and, I, you know, I guess I would say the best approach is to try to create more right. clubs and groups and organizations that they can join in real life. Um, you know, volunteering isn't just for adults. Kids can do it, too. Um, and they love it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it gives meaning and it, you know, provides connections to other people as well. So really encouraging them to spend time offline. Again, I, I'm not trying to say that online is always evil because it's not. And there are ways to connect with others online as well. But I really do think that kids in particular really do need time offline mm -hmm. and they need time in real life with other people doing things that are meaningful. Just one quick piece with that, I know we're almost out of time, is that you have, the problem is it begets everything else. So it's like, you know, how do you balance this as a parent? So I think that's kind of the question you're really asking is like, how as a parent do you do this? And, it's, and if you, you know, like you want your kids to fit in, be popular, so you want to give them an iPhone, but at the same time you want to like minimize the use that they have so that way they can figure out, you know, uh, their self-regulation and not rely on their phones and technology to manage their emotions for them. So how do you balance that? How do you say, I want my kid to fit in, have the things, but at the same time I think it's not doing them a justice. And that's kind of the piece that you really have to figure out and balance. And, and that is where someone's just gonna have to step up and, and start that process and hopefully talking to other parents, creating those groups, as you were saying, where they have um, other people that they know that, well, these kids don't have the same, you know, aren't just handed the phone from the, you know, like a rattle, you know, <laughs> and, that's, and that's their pacifier. But Mitch, I want, I, yeah. folks, I want to say too, though, that that's one of the reasons that, that parents, you know, have kids in their in activities. Right. Like, you want to have your children in activities of the things that they care about to build a sense of community for them. That's, that's what I would recommend. Ask the kid what they want to be in and, you know, and structure those things because the kids can't drive. Looks like we have one more question in the back. Are we out of time? Uh, I didn't have a question. I, sorry. Um, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to add on to something that you guys were talking about. I, I don't know if you mentioned this already, but um, when, when you were talking about, like, going to the movies by yourself or going shopping by yourself, 
I think, and at least in my experience, I think it's really crucial to to do things like that and to like build like a love for yourself and like build your own like self esteem. So then when you're in conversations with other people, you're not always trying to seek their validation or their like acceptance of you. And it's it's easier to to build a, a relationship with them um, or like uh, a connection in any way. And uh, when when you're not uh, seeking those things, it's it's easier for them to to connect with you. Mm -hmm. um, and like both both ends of the party will will end like happy, I guess. And yeah. Thank I, I think that's a really uh, crucial thing to like Thanks, Omar, for that. Yeah. I appreciate that. And I think having a strong sense of identity is the key. You know, having a strong sense of identity of who you are, being comfortable with yourself, and liking yourself is going to enable you to do things alone and feel not lonely. Absolutely. And I think self, like self-love like yeah. and um, connecting with others, I think, is a great way, way to kind of close this up and wrap this up. So I want to thank the panel members. You all are amazing. Left us with so much to think about. Yes, excellent. Um, and just one final reminder that there is a sign-in sheet at that table over there. And if you have any final questions, please come on up and chat with us. Thanks for coming, guys. That was great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, everyone. This is wonderful.